Hello, in this video I'm going to look at some improper integrals. So improper integrals usually deals with points of discontinuity for a different type of function. So for instance, um, here you have that you're integrating from minus infinity to b, but in this case, minus infinity, we need to kind of do a change of variables, or in any case, like we'll just say, let's use the limit operator as a approaches minus infinity. So in that case, uh, right here, you can add in an a and then have your b. Now the only thing though is that what we don't know is whether or not this limit exists. So we tend to say that if, uh, for example, this was to equal something, then in any case, we can either use the word uh, converge or if it doesn't exist, then that's where we say that the uh, integral diverges. So let's actually look at an example of which that we can try to practice our improper integrals. So let's say that we have the integral from two to infinity, and then we have x plus three divided by x minus one, and then you have x squared uh, plus one. And then, uh, well, there are a few things that need to be done actually. Um, so for example, we have that first of all, we definitely need to take the limit as b tends to infinity, and that way we rewrite the integral as two to b. Then we have x plus three divided by um, x minus one, and then you have x squared plus one, and of course uh, this is all with respect to x, so dx. Now the only thing though next is that we have to basically look at x plus three divided by x minus one times x squared plus one. Well that means that we need to use what is known as partial fraction decomposition. So in any case what we can say for example is that a is going to be divided by x minus 1 plus b x plus c divided by x squared plus 1 and all of this has to equal to well in any case it has to equal to uh, x plus 3 and that's divided by x minus 1 and then you have that this would be x squared plus 1 and then we'll just continue next. So what happens is that what we need to do with this is that we need to multiply by the least common denominator, which in any case is x minus one times x squared plus one. So we have a times x squared plus one plus uh, bx plus c multiplied by x minus one. Now all of this has to be equal to x plus three. Okay, now what we can do here is we can actually just plug in specific values. So for example, if I plug in one, I get that a times one squared plus one plus b plus c, but times zero, and all of that equals to four. Now notice that basically by plugging in x equals to one, we found that essentially that two a is equal to four, which means that a equals to two. Okay, so we have that a equals to two. Now, furthermore, we can actually go ahead and plug in, for example, x equals to zero. Now, if we plug in x equals to zero, that gives us a plus um, c times negative one is equal to three. But you happen to know already that a is equal to two. So in that case, you have two, um, we can do it like this, minus c equals to three. But if we do this, that's gonna tell us algebraically that you know negative c equals to negative um, Let's see, <clears throat> negative five, is that right? 
so actually sorry uh, that should be one yeah yeah so you get one but then that tells you that C equals to negative one okay now what happens next is that well we need to find essentially the constant B and we want to do this without doing any extra amount of work so here we take the a and we multiply and we get ax squared here we multiply here and we get bx squared now notice that there is no x squared term here and if you want you can put like a 0 times x squared what that means is that basically a plus b must equal to 0 because they both are x squared terms but there is no x squared term so hence they have to be 0. What that means is that b is equal to minus 2. So that gives us the following. It gives us that we have an integral as 2 divided by x minus 1 and then you have uh, minus 2x divided by x squared plus 1 but then you also have the integral minus 1 over uh, x squared plus 1. Well, the integral of this whole thing, right? Okay. So let's go ahead and put all of this together because we have that our integral can now be applied. So we have that b is tending to infinity and you have an integral from 2 to b, okay, but notice that you found that that was 2 divided by x minus 1, and then minus 2x divided by x squared plus 1, and then minus 1 over x squared plus 1, and then we'll just go ahead and put some parentheses around that, and then dx. Now, notice that basically as we do the integration, well, the integration is either just using u substitution or recognizing logarithms. So the first one is going to be 2 natural log of x minus 1 minus, okay, so we have minus, um, let's see, yeah, that's going to be minus the natural log of x squared plus 1. Now note that you could use u substitution, but since it's just 2x, we know that you end up with 1 over u, and that's just natural log, and the parentheses go away, or the absolutes go away, uh, because x squared plus 1 is definitely positive. Minus arctangent inverse of x, and we're evaluating this from 2 to b. Now notice that if we plug in um, the b, well, if you plug in b, you end up with b minus 1, okay? Now, <clears throat> if we go ahead and we rewrite this, then in any case, you have b minus 1, but it could be squared, for instance. So we have natural log of b minus 1 squared, but notice that that would be divided by b squared plus 1. So you have b squared uh, plus 1, and then we could probably just put some brackets around that, for example. But then you also have minus the arctangent inverse of b it, um, for when you plugged in b. But if we go ahead and we plug in, for example, um, the 2, well, if you plug in uh, basically the 2, you end up getting minus uh, natural log because notice that this would be 2 minus 1 but that's going to be divided by 2 squared plus 1 then that means that this is going to be minus 1 uh, fifth but natural log and then you have um, then you have plus okay so you have plus arctangent inverse of 2 okay now, in any case, uh, what ends up happening here is that if you take b to infinity, this is going to go to 1. So in any case, natural log of 1 is 0. So we have that that's going to be 0. 
minus, but arc tangent as b goes to infinity should go to pi over 2. So that goes to pi over 2. And if you want, uh, you could actually rewrite this minus natural log of 1 fifth as positive natural log of 5. And then you have arc tangent inverse of 2. But there should be a plus sign. My pluses kind of look like the same, but um, it's okay. Now, if you actually go ahead and you approximate this value, you'll find that the, um, that the integral it equals to 1.1458 uh, and I did that just by plugging in pi over 2 plus natural log of 5 and then plus arc tangent of 2. Now note that for example that means that this uh, integral actually converges so we have that this converges but it converges to 1.1458 in any case. Now, if, for example, you did not combine, for example, the two natural logs, notice that you would have gotten the strange result 2 times infinity minus infinity. So in that case, I just brought them together. Now, if you need to see more, for instance, in terms of like what happened to b minus 1 squared over b squared plus 1, you can actually just use that the coefficient or the leading term is b squared and this is b squared meaning that it's going to go to one but natural log of one is just uh is just zero in any case so this integral actually converges uh to 1.1458 okay now we can actually look at a similar one so for instance let's say that you have <clears throat> so let's say that you have the integral of 1 to infinity of 1 over x squared plus 1 dx. Now, in any case, uh, we know that this is improper form because you have to take the limit as b tends to infinity of that's going to be from 1 to b and then you have 1 over x squared plus 1 dx. Now notice that if you take the limit as b tends to infinity, that gives you arc tangent, okay? So it gives you arc tangent of x from 1 to b, but then if you plug this in, you end up with the limit as b tends to infinity of arc tangent inverse of b minus arc tangent inverse of 1. Now if you take arc tangent to infinity, then in that case, that's just going to be pi over 2 minus pi over 4 because arc tangent 1 is pi over 4. But this tells you that that answer is actually pi over 4. So we have that pi over 4 is the limit, which means that this integral, it converges. So we see that it basically converges um, for this one, okay? Now, say for example that we had uh, some points of discontinuity uh, for, um, yeah. So, if we were to look at a point of discontinuity, what I mean by that is, for example, like if you have, <clears throat> if you have the integral of, let's say that you have uh, one divided by the square root of four minus x squared uh, dx, and this was from, say for example, from zero, um, from zero to two then you know that basically that this integral is undefined at, uh, say for example, two, because you have four minus four is zero, so that's undefined. In any case, that would mean that you would have to take the limit as not x, but b tends to two, and then you have the integral from zero to b of one divided by the square root of four minus x squared uh, dx, but in any case, if you were going to use trigonometric substitution 
or just remember that uh, this is the arc sine, then that means that, um, you know, yeah, that this would be equivalent to arc sine of uh, x over 2. So you would have that this would be equivalent to arc sine inverse of x over 2. And then you would evaluate this from 0 to b. But of course, you still have the limit as uh, b tends to 2. So this means that you have uh, sine inverse of 1 minus uh, sine inverse of 0. But in any case, you have that this is actually going to be pi over 2. So this is another example of an integral that converges. Um, so we have that that, we say, converges. Now, one thing that you have to realize is that an integral doesn't always converge. But if you have that one part of it does not exist, then the whole integral does not exist. Um, let's go ahead and see another integral, for example. Let's say that you have the integral from 2 to 4 and you have dt, and then you have t, and then the square root of t squared minus 4. Now, what this means is that you have to use your u substitution or trigonometric substitution, whichever the case is. So you could say, for example, that um, 2 secant of theta equals 2. OK, so that means that that's going to be equal to t. Now, you can always use a diagram if you need to. So for example, I know that the hypotenuse is t and the adjacent is that. So the uh, opposite would be basically t squared minus 4 using Pythagorean theorem. And this would be theta. Now, what that means is that basically um, 2 tangent theta equals to the square root of t squared minus 4. OK, so we can actually just go ahead and substitute as needed. But we also have to get the derivative. So the derivative is 2 secant uh, theta tangent theta d theta. And that equals to dt. Now, of course, um, the only thing, though, is that we have to take the limit as uh, t tends to uh, 4. Now, t is tending to 4. It's tending to 4 from the left side. So we have to take the limit as t tends to 4 from the left side. And that's going to be the integral from 2. Um, well, actually, let's use a b, right? OK, so that'll be b. And then uh, this is going to be, well, somehow we have to rewrite this. OK, so um, let's see. Well, you have that the dt is going to be 2 secant, te uh, two, uh, secant theta tangent theta d theta. And then all of this is divided by 2. So we have 2 um, secant theta, because that's the t. Yes, OK, 2 secant theta. And then times um, 2 tangent theta. OK, but notice that, for instance, that the 2 secant theta definitely cancels out. That cancels out. That cancels out. And that cancels out. So what's left behind uh, is that we have We have that we can rewrite this even further. So we have that this is going to be equal to the limit as b tends to 4 from the left side. And then you have from 2 to 4, uh, not 2 to 4, but we said b, right? OK, so that's going to be 1 half um, d theta. But that means that your answer is the limit as b tends to 4 from the left. Now. This means that essentially um, you end up with one half theta, but in any case, that means that you end up with one half uh, secant 
uh, inverse of t divided by 2. And this is going to be from 2 uh, to 4. So this gives us that you end up with 1 half times uh, secant of 4. Um, actually, that should be b, right? Yeah. But, you know, it's really just notation, if anything. And I did it again. So that's b. Okay. So if we take b to 4, you're going to get secant inverse of 2. Okay, so that's secant inverse of 2 minus secant inverse of 1. Now, it looks that, for instance, that this is going to be equal to 1 half times pi over 3 minus 0, which that should give us pi over 6 as our solution. So we say that this converges to pi over 6. Now we can also find the estimate for this, but you know, most of the time we're just looking for exact values. Um, and yeah, it's a little bit messy, I apologize, but you know, um, we got the solution. Um, now, notice that you could have probably used u substitution if, for example, that we happen to remember what the derivative of secant inverse happens to be. Um, so in any case, like for example, if we happen to know, uh, you know, like what is the derivative, um, well, we'll say like x, for example, and we say uh, secant inverse of u, then in actuality, um, we can actually figure that out, um, you know, because we have 1 divided by u, and then you have the square root of u squared minus 1, and then you have du dx. But the only thing, though, is that we would have to account for the chain rule if we're going to integrate that. But one thing that I will mention is that you can also look at the limits of integration and in changing them with respect to theta, for example. And that might bypass some of the algebra that we tended to do, but, um, you know, it, it, it kind of tells you that, um, that in either case that it would have to be tending to pi over 6 where it's undefined, for example. But um, I tend to not really do it because, you know, I can just change it back in terms of x and then uh, work my way to the to the same point of getting the same answer. Um, okay, so my last example is a little easier actually. It's the integral from 0 to 4 and you have dx divided by the square root of 4 minus x. Now, notice that in this case, your u can be 4 minus x. So that means that du is negative dx. So what we'll do next here is we'll just say, well, okay, this gives me the integral um, from 0 to 4, and we have uh, basically we'll have negative du divided by the square root of u. Now, technically, I guess what we could probably do is just change the limits of integration and just say that, you know, we'll just rewrite it, for example. So like if we plug in zero, we get four, and if we plug in four, we get zero. But notice that this, this can be rewritten as the integral from zero to four, and then you have that it's just 1 over the square root of u, du. But now, notice that in this case, you have to introduce the limit as, uh, let's say, a approaches 0, but from the left side of the integral from a to 4, and then you have 1 over the square root of u, and then you have du. Now, when we do this problem, basically you'll see that this is going to be u to the negative one half divided by one half, which is pretty much uh, another way of saying that you have uh, the limit as a approaches zero from the left side. And here we go. So we have u to the negative one half plus one 
divided by basically the same thing. Um, but in any case, that's going to be 2 times the square root of u. And that's going to be from 0 to 4. Now, in this case, uh, actually it's from 0 to a, right? OK, I always do that on accident. But we see that basically that this gives you an answer of, well, root 4 is 2 times 2 is actually just uh, 4. But notice that if you plug in a, you're taking the square root of 0, which is still just 0. So in either case, the answer is just 4. Now, one thing that you can probably explore is like, uh, for example, different types of problems, like for, um, you know, volume, for instance, like if you were to talk about a function like f of x equals to 1 over x, and you're looking at it from x is greater than or equal to 1, and let's say that you want to find the volume. So if you want to find the volume as it's rotated with respect to the x-axis, then you know that you could probably just uh, say, I have volume equals to the integral from 1 to infinity, and then you have that this would be 1 over x squared. Um, but then, of course, you have the constant pi, and this would be uh, dx. Now, in any case, um, you have that if you were to integrate this, you could probably say, well, I have the limit as b tends to infinity, and then I have from 1 to b, and then I have pi, um, and then I have x to the negative 2. But you'll notice that basically that gives you a negative pi over x. So maybe uh, we can just write negative pi. OK, so we have negative pi. And this is from 1 to b. But notice that if you um, plug in b and 1, you're going to end up essentially getting uh, that this is going to be 0 because as b tends to infinity, that just becomes very small. So then that's going to be 0. But then you have minus, minus pi, which is plus pi, which equals 2 pi. So you have that the volume of 1 over x from 1 to infinity is actually equal to pi. But interestingly enough, if you were to look at the surface area, it becomes a greater question as to will the surface area exist? And you'll find that no, it does not. So in any case, we have that the volume does exist, but not the, uh, not the surface area. And if you were to look at the, you know, the solid in question, basically it would look something like this, um, where you have, um, let's see, yes, so you would have something like this. And essentially, you have that if you were to find the surface area, it would actually not exist, which means that it actually diverges um, for the surface area. And that's kind of interesting uh, if you can show, like, you know, using that the surface area is given by the integral from a to b, and then you have uh, 2 pi f of x multiplied by the square root of 1 plus f prime squared, and then that's dx, you'll see that essentially that that diverges. Okay, I didn't do a lot of examples of, uh, you know, when an integral does not exist, but in either case, this would be one of them, of where the surface area for this one does not exist. But that's kind of weird because it's telling you that the pi is the volume, but not the surface area.